Good morning. This is Bishop John with another homily from Friar Dock for the 12th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The lessons today are, are Jeremiah 20 uh, verses 10 through 13, Psalm 69 verses 8 through 10, 14 and 17, and 33 through 35. The epistle is uh, Epistle to the Romans, chapter 5 verses 12 through 15. And the Gospel is the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 10, verses 26 to 33. Today, for this 12th Sunday in Ordinary Time, the time in the church year of the Tempus Per Annum, the season over the whole year, the numbered weeks, um, we have lessons that confront how we respond to the trials and tribulations that life puts in our way. Do we call first on our God, turning to Him in faith and trust? Do we call instead on Ghostbusters? My apologies to the movie. In the reading from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 20, we see the prophet calling on God to protect him from those who are more than a little upset with his prophecies. Jeremiah said, I hear the whisperings of many, terror on every side. Denounce, let us denounce him. All those who were my friends are on the watch for any misstep of mine. Perhaps he will be trapped. Then we can prevail and take our revenge on him. But Yahweh is with me like a mighty champion. My persecutors will stumble. They will not triumph. In their failure, they will be put to utter shame, to lasting, unforgettable confusion. Yahweh of hosts, you who test the just, who probe the mind and heart, let me witness the vengeance you take on them, for to you I have entrusted my cause. Sing to Yahweh, praise Yahweh, for he has rescued the life of the poor from the power of the wicked. The Jews are complaining bitterly about Jeremiah, and he knows he is now persona non grata, as it were, a big time if they can catch any misstep of his. Jeremiah's former friends will gleefully take their revenge on him to include taking his life. And he knows it, it's in verse 10. Then he remembers he's been telling the truth and he knows Yahweh is with him like a mighty champion. His persecutors will therefore stumble and not triumph over him and will be put to utter shame and lasting unforgettable uh, confusion in verse 11. Next, Jeremiah asks a little favor since he has put his trust in God. Yahweh of hosts, you who test the just, who probe mind and heart, let me witness the vengeance you take on them. Verse 12. Finally, knowing he'll be protected, he sings praises to God because he has rescued the life of the poor from the power of the wicked. In verse 13, it looks like Jeremiah has just about had it in verse 10, but then he remembers that Yahweh is with him, like a mighty champion in verse 11, and that turns, that tells him that things will turn around and turn out badly for his persecutors. He expects their shame and confusion to coincide with their finally getting it, that is, that Jeremiah was right all along and they should have listened to him and deferred to him in the first place. He knows he is trusting Yahweh and he figures that he would like the privilege of seeing all his enemies take it in the ear. Verse 12. Convinced his prayers have been heard, the prophet praises Yahweh for his vindication and his rescue from his enemies, whether or not he gets to see them ruined. Jeremiah's reaction to being dumped on by the very people he's trying to rescue from disaster is certainly understandable. I expect it's one many of us have shared to some extent in one bad situation or another. The important point to remember, however, is that Jeremiah knows or remembers suddenly it is God who rescues him. His job is to keep telling the truth, to keep saying to one and all the words that God gives to him to say. With his focus restored, Jeremiah's fear and resentment 
are overcome by the exuberance and uh, certainty his faith brings him. Presenting his feelings to God has lifted them from his show own shoulders and his step is a bit lighter. He may not see his revenge, his vindication, but the security and joy God offers instead are much to be pre preferred. It strikes me this is something we could try too. We don't necessarily need to see justice done, let alone inflict it ourselves, to be sure our Abba and his kingdom are just. Something Paul wrote comes to mind here. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. That's in Romans 12, 19. He's citing Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35. The advisability of letting God take care of ultimate justice, of vengeance certainly, has been the rule for millennia. The same kind of situation is addressed in the verses taken this morning from Psalm 69. The responsorial verse is, Lord, in your great love answer me. For your sake I bear insult, and shame covers my face. I have become an outcast to my brothers, a stranger to my children, because zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who blaspheme you fall upon me. Lord, in your great love, answer me. I pray to you, Yahweh, for the time of your favor, O God. In your great kindness, answer me with your constant help. Answer me, Yahweh, for bounteous is your kindness. In your great mercy, turn toward me. Lord, in your great love, answer me. See, you, my lowly ones, and be glad. You who seek God, may your hearts revive. For Yahweh hears the poor, and his own who are in bonds he spurns not. Let the heavens and the earth praise him the seas, and whatever moves in them. Lord, in your great love, answer me. The psalmist bears insult for God's sake, and shame covers his face, in verse 8. He is an outcast to his brothers and a stranger to his children, in verse 9. But because he is zealous for God's house, those who blaspheme against God also insult him, in verse 10. So he prays, for the time of your favor, O God, in your great kindness answer me with your constant help, in verse 14. He pleads with Yahweh to answer him, for bounteous is your kindness, and he is sure that in his great mercy he will turn toward him, in verse 17. He urges the lowly ones and those who seek God to be glad and let their hearts revive. That's in verse 35. Because Yahweh hears the poor, and his own who are in bonds he spurns not. In verse, verse 34. Finally, the word and world and everything in it should turn to God. Let the heavens and the earth praise him, the seas and whatever moves in them. Verse 35. The responsorial verse is one I expect we've all expressed in one way or another. Uh, with or without loud Irish sighs. Lord, in your great love, answer me. Verse 14, C. A Psalm of David, Psalm 69, is one of two psalms identified as major imprecatory psalms. The other one is Psalm 109. They are psalms in which we find sustained cries for destroying, cursing, and otherwise harming with vigor one's enemies. There are many others that are considered imprecatory as well, but these two are the major ones. Psalm 69, in any case, was likely written in the late 11th century BC, near the end of King David's life. The selected verses for today describe the writer's tribulations at the hands of unjust attackers, but they also reflect his reverence for and tr his trust in God. Together, with his absolute certainty that God will care for and protect the poor and the powerless, among whom he counts himself. Although he is the king of united Israel when this is written, 
David remembers the time when he played hide and seek with King Saul's homicidal henchmen. He doesn't just sympathize with the poor and powerless, he empathizes with them. In his epistle to the Romans, chapter 5, Paul contrasts the first Adam and his legacy for all mankind with the second Adam and his gift to all mankind. Brothers and sisters, through one man sin entered the world, and through sin, death, and thus death came to all men, inasmuch as all sin. For up to the time of the law, sin was in the world, though sin is not accounted when there is no law. But death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin after the pattern of the trespass of Adam, who is the type of the one who was to come. But the gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many die, how much more did the grace of God and the gracious gift of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow for the many? Paul reminds us that sin entered the world through Adam and therefore death, so that sin and death came to all men, in verse 12. Despite the fact they didn't have the Ten Commandments, the Torah, and the Law, until the time of Moses and the Exodus, in verse 13, death reigned even over those who did not sin after the pattern of the trespass of Adam, in verse 14. Although both concern all mankind, the gift is not like the transgression in that although because of Adam many died, the gift of salvation is far greater. How much more did the grace of God and the gracious gift of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow for the many? Verse 15. The apostles' position is that the world started out good. Very good, actually, as we can read in the first chapter of the book of Genesis. And the evil of death entered it for all of us when the sin of Adam, whether or not we had the law, it entered with the sin of Adam, whether or not we had the law, and we didn't. The gift of the new Adam, Jesus Christ, conquers our sin, that is, our inherited death from the first Adam, and offers us eternal life. Our sin is ubiquitous, but the holiness Jesus offers us is overwhelmingly more, and, and more for all time. We have a choice, sin and death on the one hand, which have been our inheritance since the time of Adam and Eve or grace and eternal life on the other, which are our inheritance through Jesus Christ if we accept it. If we accept it. There's nothing complicated here. It's a straightforward choice. I should add, I suppose, that recognition of our sins is our part of the price of admission to the kingdom of God. On the one hand, our Abba's mercy and our Lord's sacrifice open the gate for us. On the other hand, if we don't recognize our sins, there can be no mercy or forgiveness for us because we won't accept it. We can't go into the pure white light of the court of the high king of heaven if we insist on keeping all our wounds, our sores and scabs with us. It's just the way things are. They may be comfortable, but they ain't right, and we have to dump them. Today's reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, is part of a series of instructions Jesus gives to his apostles before sending them out to the lost sheep of Israel, quote-unquote, to proclaim the kingdom of heaven at hand, to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and drive out demons. All this is earlier in chapter 5 of this chapter, in, in verse 5 of the chapter. These verses are essentially a pep talk. Jesus said to the twelve, Fear no one. Nothing is concealed that will not be revealed, or secret that will not be known. What I say to you in the darkness, speak in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Are not two sparrows sold for a small coin? Yet not one of them falls to the ground without your father's knowledge. Even the, all the hairs of your head are counted. 
So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my heavenly Father. But whoever denies me before others, I will deny before my heavenly Father. Jesus tells them to get rid of their fears of being exposed for one thing or another because there is nothing that will not be revealed nor secret that will not be known in verse 26. He tells them to preach publicly with what he has taught them in private. What I say to you in the darkness, speak in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim in the housetops. Verse 27. They shouldn't be afraid of those who might kill them, but rather of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Verse 28. He points out that even the lives of two sparrows sold for a small coin concern the Father in a detailed way in verse 29. And also that all the hairs of your head are counted by him in verse 30. There is no reason for them to be afraid as they are worth more than many sparrows, verse 31. The work they have to do is extremely important for the ones who hear them because the ones who believe Jesus is the Messiah and say so will be acknowledged by him before my heavenly Father, verse 32. On the other hand, the ones who deny him before others, he will deny before my heavenly Father, verse 33. We can't present facades to the people around us without worrying that someone might lift the curtain, so to speak, and expose our faults and foibles, let alone our hypocrisies. Our pride, on the other side of the coin of fear, really gets in the way of any kind of rational investigation of the problem. If we are Christians, do we honestly think our Abba is fooled just because we know he loves us? Duh! We can fool all of the people some of the time, and some of them all of the time but not all of the people all of the time, to borrow something from Abraham Lincoln, and never God. The most important mark, as it were, for all our scams is never fooled. If we admit he loves us, and all of Scripture is the story of his love affair with us, do we think it's only because he doesn't know all our secrets? No, nonsense. The good news they are proclaiming to the people of Judah carries with it some heavy choices, both for the apostles and for those who hear them. Whether it's anxiety over bad publicity, our personal needs, or humiliation and persecution, the cure is a deep and abiding faith in our Master, the Lord Jesus Christ. For followers of the way, our duty is to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth. We aren't separate clergy and laity in this. We are the priesthood of all believers. This was the deal for the apostles we see in the gospel reading today, and it's still the same deal for all of us. The world turns and turns, and some things just stay the same. Go figure. No matter how successful we become, no matter how wealthy and powerful, is all of it enough to get fear to get rid of fear? and anxiety? Jesus is sending the apostles out on a training mission here and we can, can imagine they're not displaying the kind of confidence and, and certainty our Lord knows they will need for their upcoming ministries. He's given them practical instructions as we can see earlier in the chapter. But here is where he gives them a spinal fusion as it were. What they need, what all of us need, is a belief in something much greater than we are to allay our fears when we finally profoundly understand that we are not in control of the world around us. Putting our trust anywhere other than in the arms of God, as you might expect, is a poor choice. All of the lessons today ask us which way will turn when the going gets tough? Our Abba finds good in all of his creation and finds great joy in us when we turn to him in faith and trust. 
Compared to this, no matter how stressful and difficult, not to say impossible, things are around us, nothing except the kingdom of God amounts to a hill of beans. When we turn to mankind, to Caesar, we, oh, okay. Will we turn, finally, and this is the end, will we turn to mankind, to Caesar, or to God? How trustworthy, even in the short term, are the honor, the mores, and opinions of any of us when we preen over our grand accomplishments? Please, as my friend Kenyon used to say. Ultimately, the arms and armor of our mighty kings rust and fade away as well. It's not so when we trust in the high king of heaven, when we sit ourselves down in the hollow of his hand. It's not so when we put on the armor of Jesus Christ and trust in the meanderings of the Holy Spirit. God bless you and keep you and all of yours.